I'm Brad Thor, and my book is Deadfall. There is a rogue Russian military unit. They've gone to AWOL, and they are committing horrific war crimes uh, in the interior of Ukraine because all the able-bodied men are off fighting the war. While these guys are rampaging through the countryside of Ukraine committing horrific war crimes, an American aid worker goes missing. Now, America can't send in troops because then Russia will say, you've committed to the war. We're now at war with the United States. So the U.S. says, we've got one guy. We'll send our top spy into Ukraine. And they give him one assignment, find her. If she's dead or alive, we want her back. And then we want everyone responsible for, t for taking her to pay. And so that's what happens. My main character, Scott Harvath, gets sent over, America's number one spy, to find her, bring her back, and make the bad guys pay. This is 22 in the Scott in the Scott Harvest series, yes. What do you think makes this character have such longevity for you? For me as a writer, I know why I like it, because he's my alter ego. I joke that he gets to do the things that my wife won't let me do, right? But I think readers really enjoy Harvath because no matter how tough it is, he always does the right thing. So if you're going to have a representative of the American government who you're going to take the shackles off of and you're going to say, listen, no Marcus at Queensbury, you go do what needs to be done, we're kind of not going to look, no rule book for you. You can't send a sadist to do that job, somebody that delights in hurting other people. You have to send somebody with a good moral compass who's only going to break the rules if he has to, to save that American citizen or stop that bomb from going off in Times Square or whatever. So I think what people love about Harvath is not only does he do the right thing, but he's somebody you'd want to sit down and have a beer with. He's got a sense of humor. He's a human being. He's not a Superman. He's not dodging bullets the whole book. Right. You know, he gets, he's based on a lot of people that I know that are still in the field and are, you know, they're, they're doing everything they can to, to, to remain out there because they believe that uh, there is no American dream without those willing to protect it. Deadfall was clearly inspired by the atrocities in Ukraine. Is it dangerous to know that you're writing about events in real time, knowing that this book won't come out, though, for another year? Yeah, so that was a concern. But the, the way I approached this was I grew up loving thrillers that took place in World War II. And I love the movies like Saving Private Ryan, I love the series Band of Brothers, uh, the Tank movie with Brad Pitt, Fury, fantastic. Yeah. And I always wanted to write a story like that for Harvath, my, my main character. And I couldn't put him in the DeLorean and beam him back to you know 1930s, <laughs> 1940s uh, Europe. But what I could do is take advantage of what is happening in Ukraine and use it as a backdrop. So my goal with Deadfall is to create a, an evergreen story that would be along the lines of a Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, Fury sort of a thing that you could pick up Deadfall five, 10 years from now and still have a great thrill ride. So that was my goal with this. But yeah, I was worried about writing, a, a setting a thriller in real time, that there could be a major thing that might change over there and could have an impact, but I got lucky. You got lucky yeah. and I think the book will stand alone. How do you get the details right when you're not there yourself? For a book many years ago, I went over to Afghanistan during the war and I embedded with a unit over there and got to see a lot of what was going on. Um, I like to travel to the places I write about and meet the people there. If I can't, then I want to talk to somebody who has operated there. So I want to talk to somebody who's in special operations, the intelligence community, something like that. And I'm lucky enough to have great contacts that I can get wired into people and talk to people. We've got, we've got Americans on the ground helping train forces in Ukraine, so we're not fighting. But there are Americans that are fighting for the Ukrainian International Legion. And I will tell you, in addition to the people I was able to network into, this is really the first war that you can actually watch unfold on GoPro. If you go on YouTube, so many, Amer uh, so many uh, Americans, Canadians, Australians, so many English-speaking soldiers helping the Ukrainians fight are streaming everything. So it was an amazing wealth of, of uh, video for me to actually watch these battles unfold and things like that. I had no idea. When did you realize that you wanted to write books specifically about international intrigue and 
terrorism threats. So I, you and I, before we started rolling, were talking about my career was in public television. I mean, I'm, I've come home you to do this show. Welcome home. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I had done two seasons of my travel show, Traveling Light. It was nationwide on public television. I was the producer, the writer, the host. Uh, it was the late 90s, early 2000s. And I got married and my wife and I went on our honeymoon and we were in Italy in a piazza one night having a glass of wine and my wife asked me a question. I joke around, this is a good question to ask before you get married, not on the honeymoon. And she said, what would you, because it's very revealing. Mm. And she said, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? Mm. And I never finished that first book. I'd only written a couple chapters and I said, I would regret never trying to write a novel, getting it finished, and getting it published. And she said, okay, when we get home, you need to start spending two hours of protected time every day making that dream come true. So it was with Trisha's encouragement that I decided to, to do that when I got home. But what's interesting is on that trip, we had an overnight train ride from Munich. We'd been in Octo at Oktoberfest to Amsterdam. And I met a young lady, and we, uh, we had a shared overnight train compartment, young brother and sister from Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Big public television watchers. They recognized me right away. They were fans of the show. Wow. And the young lady in this brother-sister team and I stayed up talking about books all night long. And I thought, okay, I've told my wife I'm gonna write a book. I'll tell her because the more people I tell, I'll really be committed to doing this. Right. And so we talked books and she said, are you gonna make more episodes of your public television travel show when you get home? And I said, no, I'm gonna actually, uh, I'm, we're on a break right now, I'm gonna write a novel. When we pulled into the train station in Amsterdam the next morning, we went to exchange information and she handed me her business card and she was a sales rep for Simon & Schuster. No kidding. Yeah, she said, if you write that book, I wanna read your manuscript and if I can help you at Simon & Schuster, I'm gonna do it. And I've been with uh, Deadfall is my 23rd novel overall. I've been with Simon Schuster the whole time, thanks to Cindy Jackson from Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, come on. Yeah, <laughs> and I can take it, Jeremy, one step further. We went to check into our hotel. It was not, our room wasn't ready yet. And the desk, uh, the manager said, I'm so sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Thor, we're getting it ready for you. But there's a cafe around the corner. Why don't you go over there, have a sandwich, have a cup of coffee. Uh, and by the time you get back, the room will be done. We went over, we sat down and I'm looking around and I find a, an, English language newspaper, the old International Herald Tribune. So that's what I'm gonna read while I'm, we're waiting for our food, and I'm flipping through, and I find this little article about a Swiss intelligence officer who has embezzled money from the Swiss Army and is training his own shadow militia high in the Alps with high-tech weapons from his own private arsenal. And I said, that's the book I'm gonna write. That's gonna be the genesis of the idea. So yeah. that's how I got to international thrillers and terrorism and wow. that kind of a thing. What would you say is essential for a Brad Thor book? What does it have to have? So there's some hallmarks. Uh, I don't have a formula. A lot of people say, oh, I wonder if he's got a formula. I wish it was that easy. I wish it was just like a cookie cutter and you could just mix up the ingredients for your cookies yeah. and you'd get a, get a bestseller. Because I don't think Deadfall follows a, a formula at all. It, none, of them, none of them do. Yeah. Uh, so some of the hallmarks are, I want action on page one. So that's, that's the big thing. The minute you open the book, I want something to be happening to draw you in. Uh, I like short, crisp, cinematic chapters. I, they're like Pringles. So those quick, fast chapters, uh, action on page one. And I call what I do, Jeremy, faction, where you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins. So I do a ton of research for my books, but my number one job is to entertain you. So I want you to have this white knuckle thrill ride. But if you close my books a little bit smarter or having some questions about things, that's the icing on the cake uh, for me as an author. And so many people tell me, I love to read your books with my laptop open or my phone right there because I Google stuff because I can't believe these things are real that you're talking about. I gotta ask about bad guys. You've got some really, really bad guys in this. What makes a believable bad guy? They've gotta be three-dimensional. You have to have someone that's believable and they have to have a reason they're doing what they're doing. They can't all be megalomaniacs and psychotic and that kind of a thing. So you do see that um, 
in really well-developed bad guys, you can actually relate to them a little bit. They make sense. Uh, what they're doing makes sense. And there's a, I, they're a product of their environment, right? So particularly with Deadfall, I, it was important to me to do the backstory of the guy who takes this mercenary unit and kind of peels off from the Russians and says, we're not going to listen to Moscow anymore. We, we, this is, it's a candy store in sure, Ukraine. Sure. There's no law and order. <laughs> we can go take whatever and whomever we want. So we're going to go do that. But to explain why that would appeal to this guy in the people working for him, you had to do his backstory. And so that's why I wanted that. I call him the colonel in this because I'm a big fan of Apocalypse Now. And so there was Colonel Kurtz in, in that movie. So there is a little bit of that Marlon Brando character in the bad guy in Deadfall. I think so many times in these books, if you don't have that believable bad guy, they just don't sing as well, yeah. you know? And so this time, I feel like thank it really you. does. Brad, thank you. You're this welcome. This was really enjoyable. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. And thank you for watching A Word on Words. I'm Jeremy Finley. Remember, keep reading. I signed for an ex-special operations person, and I said, what do you want me to sign? And he said, stay in the fight. So there is this mentality of, you're never out of the fight. I really like that. And when this gentleman said, sign it, stay in the fight, and think about it, you really should do that in all your books. That's where stay in the fight came from. Thank you.